Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning to the conference and welcome to this next session focusing on peatland restoration in action, restoration trajectories and results. So as we as we know, some peatland ecosystem responses to restoration are quite slow and monitoring aimed at detecting a threshold based attainment of a condition state may well be less suited to demonstrating progress along a recovery pathway. It's also the case that if we are to adapt our restoration measures, then early evidence is going to be essential. Detecting change along a trajectory of recovery is particularly relevant to time-limited projects such as EU LIFE-funded projects where actions on the ground may well not start until year two of a five-year programme, which has to report in a mere two or three years' time. So uh, the whole issue of restoration trajectories is highly topical and relevant and several of our speakers come from uh, a life project background uh, and um, we have a varied range of, of speaker backgrounds altogether. So we're going to um, start with Richard Lindsay who uh, probably needs no introduction but is Head of Environmental and Conservation Research at uh, University of East London and a Senior Research Advisor to the IUC and UK Peatland Programme. Richard has a long and distinguished history of involvement in peatland conservation and peatland monitoring and is of course well known to the IUCN audience as the lead author of many IUCN briefings and of course the eyes on the bog methodology in particular. So uh, many thanks and over to you Richard. Peatlands come in two distinct flavours, sweet and sour. Sweet in the sense of sweet or fresh water and sour in the sense of acidic low nutrient conditions that preserve like pickling vinegar. Peatlands that form where sweet fresh water flows across the landscape into areas of water gathering are termed fens and fens represent a particular challenge to target setting for ecosystem restoration because many in the UK, perhaps most fens are not climax habitats. Natural succession tends to drive our fen systems towards a form of temperate peat swamp forest, a habitat known by the ancient term car. Our valued fen peatlands, by and large, represent various stages along the successional line from open or flowing water to this tree dominated climax stage. Consequently, if we are conserving or restoring a particular type of fenland system, we are faced with a decision. Which stage in this successional sequence do we most value or seek on this site? And how do we intend to arrest further successional development once that desired state has been reached? Even such small and apparently stable fens as these tiny spring mires are not free from such decisions, because if grazing were to be reduced within this landscape, these little mires would soon become like the spring mires of Epping Forest in Essex, where such features exist as wet peat forming systems beneath an oak and birch woodland canopy. Indeed, across Scandinavia, one of the main threats to the continued existence of valued fen systems has been the abandonment of traditional agricultural practices as younger generations migrate to the city and the ageing rural population steadily declines. Much of the research undertaken by Asbjorn Moen recipient of the King of Norway's medal for his services to nature conservation, has been focused on establishing exactly what type of fen ecosystems they are seeking to maintain or achieve, and the best ways to maintain these traditionally managed fenland systems. It's therefore important to be very clear about the basis for decision making behind target setting for fenland ecosystems. Our sour peatlands are of course the peat bogs and here the question of succession takes a different form. If left long enough, and by long I mean a thousand years or more, 
our bog systems have the capacity to repair themselves entirely without intervention from us because they are essentially climax ecosystems. We know this because almost uniquely we can look at the story of their whole development stored in the peat archive. Wild tree cover has waxed and waned at the margins of these systems. The peat archive shows that our bog peats have remained essentially treeless open landscapes for thousands of years, adjusting their species composition and microtopography through multiple shifts of climate to maintain conditions which broadly favour peat accumulation at faster or slower rates through the millennia. Human intervention, however, has significantly altered the face of these bog landscapes to the point where the default position for up to 80% of our peat bog systems consists of a surface dominated by tussock and microerosion characterised by heather, hairstail cotton grass, deer hair grass, wavy hair grass or purple moorgrass. The challenge for target setting in our bog systems is therefore rather like an art restorer faced with a masterpiece which has been covered by some completely botched attempt at art restoration. There is, incidentally, a great 99% invisible episode about this called The Many Deaths of a Painting. The Peat Archive in the Peak District and old photos, of course, Karen in Wales, suggest that bog pools once existed in both locations. But now? What then? should be the targets for these defaced areas. How do we know what is original and what is simply botched application of acrylic medium? The art restorer will tell you that the most important thing in restoration is never to do anything that cannot be undone. The second rule is to work with the character of the original material, allowing it to express itself. The same two rules could be applied to the setting of restoration targets for our bog ecosystems. Intervene using approaches which support the natural character and processes of the bog system as far as possible, and keep irreversible interventions to the minimum necessary to support those natural processes. If the climate can support the presence of bog pools, those pools will develop naturally over time. We don't need to force the issue and impose pool formation on the system. If in future the climate will only support a bog dominated by hummock forming sphagnum species, the system will create such a landscape. But crucially, the reverse is not true. We should not assume that a hummock dominated landscape is all that the system can support if at the same time there are malign factors bearing down on that system. Only when these malign factors have been removed can we be sure that the system is beginning to express its true character. And let's not forget that Time is a crucial factor in all this. An art restorer may take several years to rescue a damaged painting. A damaged peat bog may require much longer for complete restoration and recovery. Our own work on Moore House suggests that there is a clear sequence of recovery from its legacy of managed burning as a grouse moor, and this sequence is measured in many decades, perhaps even a century or more. Moore House is recovering since managed burning ceased when it was bought as a National Nature Reserve in the early 1950s. And Chris Evans will be able to say more about the carbon consequences of this recovery in his talk. But it is still some way from being a restored masterpiece. Finally, and serving you a dish of 
sweet and sour peatland, it should not be forgotten that our blanket mire landscapes are mires, not merely bogs. They are crisscrossed with fen systems which, unfortunately, tend to be rather ignored or overlooked in blanket bog restoration efforts, despite adding hugely to the biodiversity of these landscapes and invariably forming the hydrological bookends to our blanket bog systems. Do these upland fens also undergo succession? Undoubtedly they would if grazing and burning were not so intense across so much of our blanket mire landscapes. These fen systems, if given a chance, would most likely be characterised by fingers of open and wooded fen extending far into our blanket mire systems like filigree or lace. This woodland on our blanket bog margins may also be the original key to the stability of our bog margins on the hill slopes, as indeed I've explored in my notorious Blumange PowerPoint presentation, still available from my university publications repository. So, we've gone from sweet to sour, to sweet and sour, to Blumange. Perhaps we've come to the end of this particular episode of Bake Off, and you are all winners. Many thanks to Richard there for a, a characteristically thought-provoking and um, uh, national sort of overview of, of, of the issue. Uh, so many thanks. Our next uh, speaker is Dr. Emma, Emma Shuttleworth. Uh, who is a lecturer in physical geography at the University of Manchester. Her research focuses on working with practitioners to evidence the multiple benefits of blanket bog restoration. And uh, Emma was co-author of an influential paper on trajectories of ecosystem change in restored blanket peatlands published in the Science of the Total Environment a few years ago. Uh, so thank you, Emma, over to you. Thanks for inviting me to speak today. I'm going to give you an overview of the long term monitoring work that the University of Manchester have been doing with Moors for the Future over the last 10 years on Kinder Scout. First as part of the Making Space for Water project and now as part of More Life 2020. Before I show you the trajectories, let's start with an overview of the restoration that I'll be talking about. Before restoration took place, Kinder was in a sorry state with wide expanses of bare peat and deeply incised erosional gullies. In late 2011 and early 2012, Morse for the Future revegetated 84 hectares of this degraded peat on Kinder Edge using the classic lime seed fertiliser and mulch approach to establish a nurse crop mainly composed of amenity grasses to provide initial ground cover and stabilise the eroding surfaces. Stone and timber dams were also installed in some of the erosional gullies. And you can see from the aerial image taken from Google in 2017, the area has now almost got full vegetation cover. We had set up three experimental micro catchments in 2010, so we had a year's worth of monitoring data before any of those interventions took place. And we now have nearly 10 years of post intervention data that we can build our trajectories on. You can see the locations of the micro catchments in the image here. The red dot over on the right is the area that remained untouched that we use as a control to assess how far we've come from those bare conditions. The green dot was revegetated but not gully blocked. And the blue dot represents a catchment that was revegetated and gully blocked, and then also had a further phase of restoration in 2015 when sphagnum was planted. Before I show you the trajectories, I'll give you a quick refresher on the initial results from Making Space for Water, where we only had a couple of years of post-intervention data, which we lumped together into a single post-intervention data set. We monitored a wide range of things, mainly focused on hydrological function and flood control. Over on the left, you can see that sediment production was reduced substantially to volumes that are in the same range as intact peatlands. In the middle, you can see that water tables recovered a bit by just over three centimetres over the course of three years. And on the right, you can see 
that there was also a greater incidence of overland flow following restoration, which ties in with the water tables rising, indicating that the peat was re-wetting. The data presented on the previous slide focused on the impacts of revegetation alone. But when it comes to storm flow, we're able to see the impact of revegetation and the additional benefits provided by gully blocking. On the left of the slide, you can see these impacts presented as a series of storm hydrographs. The hydrographs on the very left show that before intervention, all three of our micro catchments were behaving the same way, with high peak flows and short lag times lag times being the time between maximum rainfall intensity and peak flow, meaning that lots of water was running off the landscape very quickly. The hydrographs over on the right show the catchments were behaving shortly after restoration. The red line represents the control site that was left bare, and you can see that it's behaving pretty similarly to how it did before. But the other two lines have changed. The green line shows the revegetated site, where you can see that the peak in flow is reduced and delayed, showing how the vegetation has attenuated flow. And the blue line shows the site that was revegetated and gully blocked, and you can see that there has been further attenuation of flow compared to revegetation alone. On the right of the slide, you can see some graphs that give you an idea of the magnitude of these changes relative to the bear control with the data for the revegetated site shaded green and the site that was revegetated and gully blocked shaded blue. In the top two graphs, you can see the increases in lag time and reductions in peak flow, and that the addition of gully blocks doubles the impact of revegetation alone. Then crucially, you can see in the bottom right graph that there has been no change in percentage runoff. So that's the proportion of rainfall that becomes storm flow meaning that there was no change in storage in the catchments. This indicates that the attenuation of the hydrographs comes from increased roughness provided by the vegetation and gully blocks that slows the flow of water across the land surface. I realise that I'm halfway through my talk and I haven't really mentioned trajectories yet, but it's important to see those initial step changes immediately following restoration so we can understand the starting point of our trajectories and the processes that control them. The key control on most of the processes is the presence of vegetation. So this is a good place to start thinking of our longer term trajectories of change. You'll notice I've shaded the graphs a little differently to the ones before. The red shaded area represents the pre-intervention period. The green represents the first phase of restoration. So that's the nurse crop and gully blocking and the blue area represents the period following sphagnum planting. Let's first consider how bare peat cover has changed. Over on the left of the slide, you can see that there was an immediate rapid reduction in bare peat cover following the initial restoration. And that by the time we get to five years post intervention, bare peat cover plateaus off at virtually zero. The graph in the middle shows that the trajectory of indicator species is a little slower and that we're still seeing changes, albeit less rapid ones, 10 years after restoration. Finally, over on the right, you can see how bryophyte cover has changed through time. And I want you to focus on the light green line, where you can see a slow but steady spread of sphagnum since the second phase of restoration through sphagnum planting in 2015. Moving on, we can see that the sediment story hasn't changed since that initial step change immediately following restoration, mainly because there's nowhere for the trajectory to go, as we were already seeing sediment volumes comparable to intact sites, as the nurse crop did its job binding the surface and protecting it from erosion. Water tables, on the other hand, have continued their slow, steady recovery. There are two lines on this graph as we're having to account for the fact that the control site has continued to erode so it doesn't provide a nice steady reference point to compare the restored sites to but we're confident that the magnitude of water table recovery falls somewhere in that grey shaded area. Finally let's take a look at the storm flow trajectories. I've separated these graphs into different slides as they now have quite a lot of data to take in the graph on the left shows the site that was revegetated and then had no further treatment, while the graph on the right shows two phases of restoration at the gully blocked and sphagnum site. 
and here we're looking at peak flows. And you can see after that initial step change that we first saw, both sites have continued to see further reductions in peak flow over time as the vegetation has matured and diversified, providing an even rougher surface than the nurse crop alone. When looking at lag times, we can see that there has been no further change in the, at the revegetated site. But over on the right, you can see that there has been a steady increase in lag times following the reintroduction and gradual spread of sphagnum. Before everyone lets out a big cheer at the sphagnum graph, I want to caveat it with a warning that we aren't 100% sure that this is definitely an impact of the sphagnum and that it may be something to do with how gully blocks mature over time. But I'll come back to an extra bit of evidence to address that in a moment. And finally, we can see that there is still no change in the volume of runoff being produced, providing further evidence that any flood risk reduction benefit comes from surface roughness rather than storage. OK, so that's where we're up to with the trajectories work. I'd like to finish by telling you about some of the other work that's happening to add extra evidence to what I've presented here today. Firstly, that issue of whether sphagnum is having an impact on lag times. As part of the Protect NFM project, we've started monitoring some catchments that were blocked during the first phase of restoration, but then didn't have any sphagnum planted in 2015. And you can see that they fill that gap between the revegetation only site and the site that was gully blocked and then later planted with sphagnum, indicating that sphagnum is slowing the flow of water and lengthening lag times. There's also further work taking place as part of More Life, looking at the impact of adding sphagnum to sites dominated by different species. So soon we'll have trajectories for those different starting states too. And as part of PROTECT, we're also looking at the impacts of different types of interventions to see how they fit in with our bare peak trajectories. And finally, this is a plea that some of my colleagues will be sick of hearing from me, but I'd like to stress the importance of continuing to monitor and extend these trajectories to truly understand how long it will take to fully restore these damaged systems. Thanks for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have in the Q&A at the end of this session. Thank you very much to Emma. Uh, some uh, a lovely talk there showing the value of, of long term data sets. And just a reminder really to the audience, do uh, do please submit questions. Uh, we've got some coming in, uh, some really good ones coming in and let's please have some more. Uh, so the next speaker is uh, Jenny Sharman. Uh, Jenny's been working for the Yorkshire Peat Partnership for the past four years and is currently a project officer on Pennine Peat Life. And Jenny is going to share the panel with Alistair Lockett and Chris Miller uh, in looking at restoration work that's been carried out across the Pennine Peat Life uh, sites. So uh, over to you, Jenny. Many thanks. The Pennine Peat Life project has taken on restoration across three very diverse regions and sites. The Forest of Boland, its proximity to the Irish Sea, subjecting the surrounding hills to a barrage of heavy rainfall, shaping the landscape's characteristic deep, wide and extensive system of gullies. And its strange underground labyrinth of peat pipes. Further east, the high altitude Pennine peat life sites of the Yorkshire Dales, exposed to extreme weather systems that have combined with the impacts of past land management to create a complex web of dendritic channels. Vast expanses of flat bare peat and deep gully systems. The North Pennine sites are different again. Here, past damage from wildfire is compounded by the high altitude, relentless precipitation and recent land use to produce extensive areas of bare peat and sediment-filled channels. Each area has stimulated a greater understanding of how our peatlands work and the means to help restore them. Hi, I'm Chris Miller. I've been managing some of the Foster Boland sites for the Pennine Peat Life Project and hopefully behind me you can see some of the challenges that we've faced and the, probably the biggest is the amount of erosion that has happened up here and you can see 
that in a lot of places the peat has been eroded down to the mineral soil underneath and further down the system there are some really really wide gullies so you're talking typically five to ten meters wide and we've even got one gully that's as wide as the m6 motorway which is absolutely massive to meet those challenges as well as using the usual toolkit of stone dams timber dams reprofiling we've also had to adapt those to some of the challenging situations that we have out here this is an example uh, of one of the uh, solutions to the problem that we've got here with really, really wide gullies. The gully I'm studying is about six, seven meters wide. So you can't conventionally block that, that size gully. But what you can do is you can slow the flow. So what we've got here is we've got a stone baffle, which is pushing the water out away from the eroding edge. And it's also slowing it down as well and just taking some of the energy and erosive force you can see the effect it's had because behind it you can see the pool of water but up front uh, in front downstream of the dam you can see here you can see a lot of the rocks that were eroded out and this is what the channel further upstream used to look like in addition to the stone baffles we've also been using these uh, timber baffles where the peat's a little bit deeper but we've still got a very wide gully and we've got strong flow going along it and as you can see here they work really quite well. The Forest of Boland sites are also filled with an underground web of peat pipes. What we've done is put some stone, leaky stone dams in there just to try and slow the flow because if we blocked the flow because it's so strong it could easily divert off and cause erosion elsewhere. So really a stone dam was the only option that we had just to take some of the energy and erosive force out of these peat pipes. I'm here sat in another one of the collapsed peat pipes that we find in the Forest of Boland. Uh, I think this one I could probably actually crawl up. Uh, it's, it, it's that big. But you can see that we've now, because of the stone dam, we've actually started to hold back quite a bit of water and just slow the flow. So we're starting to see peat slowly accumulate in this area here. This is, this is the start of... Um, this collapsed pipe slowly filling itself in. I'm Alistair Lockett and I work for the North Pennines A1B Partnership and we cover the northern area of the Pennine Peat Life Project. This is a typical bare peat site in the North Pennines. Uh, on average we are colder, wetter and higher compared to other PPL sites and the South Pennines. So this means that we have a shorter growing season, um, we have plenty of rain and really extreme weather conditions that lead to pronounced frost heave. Due to our climatic conditions, it, a critical component of our restoration work is heather brash. So heather brash is critical to get an even cover and the brash thick enough to prevent frost heave and to create an artificial water table that prom not only promotes sphagnum but also vegetation growth. In this area here um, has been treated with sphagnum rich brash. It was treated three years ago and has de developed a really nice um, kind of bed of, of feather moss and also sphagnum moss as well. So what this does is stabilise the peat, it keeps it damp during the dry springs and encourages moorland plants to grow. If the heather brash doesn't contain a good amount of moss or is, if it's spread too thinly, then the frost heave breaks apart the moss layer and then it doesn't have the desired effect and is susceptible to erosion. So this bit here, um, that there hasn't been any heather brash or if it has then it hasn't been spread very thick at all and, and, and this peat is very dry, crumbly. Uh, it's very, very difficult for plants to, to bed into um, and, and will continue to erode. So this area that I'm studying now is, is, is a really good example of a, a good cutting site for, for heather brash. So it's heather dominated, but it also includes um, feather mosses and sphagnum mosses and um, other moorland plants. So we utilize, utilize local areas of relatively good blanket bog which we're quite lucky, we do have quite a lot of in the North Pennines. But because of that, our, our contractors need to use specialised track machines because it is quite soft and quite boggy at times. Um, so they use track machinery to cut and harvest vegetation and that minimises the damage to the blanket bog. Hi, I'm Jenny Sharman and I've been managing most of the Yorkshire Dales and Nidderdale A and B sites for Pennine Peat Life and I'm going to try to show you some of the challenges that we've had up here and 
what kind of interventions we've used to meet them. All our sites are subjected to very extreme weather conditions that not only create and perpetuate the damage of these very degraded sites, but also, when coupled with the lack of vegetation cover and an intact hydrological system, they lead to vast amounts of water and sediment coming off the hills and washing into key catchments like the rivers Yore, Nid and Wharf, and polluting key habitats like the Triple SI site of Semmer Water. Consequently, restoring the hydrology is a priority and we use all the might of traditional interventions like peat dams, stone dams and timber dams. So in addition to the traditional interventions, we've also used a lot of coir logs. We've mainly used them on flat bare peat areas and also in shallower gullies just to do the same thing, slow the flow and collect sediment and allow that vegetation to come back. And I have to say, they've been a revelation. Positioned to slow down the runoff over the surface to enable the return of vegetation, we're also experimenting with the logs as a way to protect the base of deeper, wider gullies from being constantly undercut by the channels beneath them. Over the two years since they were put in, they've certainly proved their worth. As well as slowing the flow, substantial amounts of sediment have been collected and slowly the cotton grasses and mosses have begun to take root, filling in the brown with an encouraging shade of green. So while I really, really love coir logs, I think that if I was to give an award to the best newcomer in the uplands, I think it would have to go to the peat bund. The peat bunds are modelled on lowland style bunds, adapted to work in upland gullies like this one, that are peat based and often vegetated, but that are clearly still channeling a great deal of flow. Constructed in a similar fashion to peat dams, it's often surprising how much water they hold back. But when keyed into the sides and built to the correct standard, they work instantly to stop the flow of water and sediment from damaging the catchment area below. The bund being built here now looks like this. It forms part of a network of bunds and dams that have transformed this landscape. The buns we've installed range from about three meters wide to about five meters. And two years down the line, they're all still successfully holding back water and are filling with sphagnum and cotton grasses. They're also a great sanctuary for insects. Now that we're nearing the end of our project, it's great to see these sites are now dotted with small pools sitting behind dams and buns sediment building behind them, slowly re-wetting and greening this broken landscape and better protecting the area's catchments. Critically, it's hoped these areas will help create the resilience peatlands and their inhabitants will need as our climate continues to change. That's great, Jenny and colleagues. Thank you very much. Uh, some really inspiring uh, video shown there. And uh, just to say, we're getting some really fabulous questions coming in. So do please um, uh, indicate which ones you really want to see asked by uh, clicking on them. Our next speaker, we're hearing from Alistair Lockett again, actually. Alistair is a senior field officer with the North Pennines AONB partnership. Uh, over to you, Alistair. I'm Alistair Lockett and I work for the North Pennines A1B Partnership on the Pennine Peat Life Project. And we're going to have a look at looking at trajectories and restoration results. So part of the Pennine um, Peat Life Project, um, through the restoration work, we found that we, we have two key factors um, that are really, really important and really vital 
um, to get on the restoration site onto a positive trajectory. And these are hydrology and stabilization. So build it and they will come. So we aim to create a sustainable habitat that will be able to adapt to climate change. Um, and a key part of that is raising the water table and stabilizing the water table. So we create the right habitat within the bare peat areas and it will allow plants and mosses to establish. Across the different, um, the di there's differences within the project, um, as you can see in the, these pictures. Um, so whether to flood areas of bare peat and allow um, it to revegetate um, with wetter species such as Sphagnum cuspidatum, um, or we, whether we have a stable water table um, but don't flood it um, and then that enables kind of intermediate plants to establish um, such as, as Sphagnum caplifolium or Sphagnum palustra. Um, these two different um, techniques do give very different trajectories and habitats, uh, either a more open water or fully um, vegetated yet yet still fully functioning, um, uh, sorry, a fluctuating water table. So we have um, uh, peat bonds here that have completely flooded areas um, with sphagnum cuspidatum coming through, same with the wood. Um, and then we have coir that, that, that holds water uh, in the wetter parts and slows that flow of water, um, but just keeps the, the peat nice and damp. So the second um, aspect of, of um, our restoration is moss rich brash, uh, or in, in particular for us in the North Pennines is, is sphagnum rich brash. So um, we have adapted a well-known successful technique to fit colder, wetter and higher areas in the Pennine Peat Life project. And this for us means using moss rich brash. So the main aim is to protect the surface of the peat from frost heave and drying out. We aim to cut the brash uh, on relatively good condition blanket bog. So um, this is heather dominated, however, it's got sphagnum moss within it and, and, and lots of feather mosses as well. And what that does is um, it includes, the brash includes lots and lots of sphagnum fragments um, that will, um, as long as we get the habitat right of where we spread the brash in terms of the water table, these will all grow into, into new sphagnum plants. To counter the, the really extreme and pronounced frost heave um, we get further north, we, and also to create an artificial water table, we spread the brash much, the brash much, much thicker um, so that none of the bare peat is visible. Um, and if we get this right, then um, we can get a, a contiguous, um, continuous uh, cover over the bare peat that will will develop into a uh, really really nice um interesting blanket bog vegetation um so this is three years after restoration from one of our sites and you can see um you know there's, there's a complete cover of sphagnum moss there um, and then also other plants um have started to bed in there another slight, slight adaptation that we we have to do um up here is timings. So uh, predominantly most of our sites are um, shot for red grouse and so we have to squeeze our restoration into a very tight window between October and the end of March. So putting a uh, lime seed and fertilizer on at the end of March, for us that grown season may not have started yet. So that lime and fertilizer in particular will have um, a, a much um, a bigger effect on the mosses within the brash rather than the seeds that we put down and the seeds will will, will grow from the brash and from the, the developing mulch. If we um, can't access or, or can't um, achieve sphagnum rich brash or moss rich brash or we spread it too thinly then we don't have that that protective cover of um, uh, mosses and what that happens is that the frost heave can break open and break apart the brash, uh, the brash layer, um, and it's very susceptible to erosion. So it's really key that we get that thickness right and we get it consistent across the site as well. 
So those are, are two techniques that um, you know really well established, but we've just changed them slightly or adapted them um, to fit kind of the the cold wetter uh, climates that we have. Um, and um, Chris um, from Most of the Future will be talking about very similar techniques, but um, how uh, they've developed um, the techniques um, in the in the South Pennines. Many thanks to Alastair uh, for a lovely uh, talk. Our next uh, speaker uh, is uh, from uh, Chris Fry. Chris is Conservation Quality Manager for the Moors for the uh, Future Partnership, where he's worked for 10 years. His work is focused on the restoration of damaged uh, blanket mire, including wildfire sites. Uh, many thanks. Over to you, Chris. Hello, my name's Chris Fry, and I work for Moors for the Future. I've been working about 10 years. I'm the Conservation Quality Manager. And as you can see from these photographs, most of the future has been working on some somewhat damaged sites and we have encountered a variety of problems over nearly 20 years now. We also know that we're working on very vulnerable sites. This graph shows you the water table on the Roaches Estate, which is in the Southwest Peak. It shows you how the water table behaved in the summer of 2017-18 1819 and it shows you how the drought in 2018 caused an extreme change to the water table the site dried out in response to that that weather and so it became very vulnerable and dry the fuel for the vegetation and the peat was very available and dry and there's one ignition event of a barbecue that barbecue removed 60 hectares of vegetation burnt the deep the peat deeply and as you can see the water table changed thereafter it was much more variable, the water tables are stable, and the growing conditions changed significantly. As you can see, it doesn't look very good. It altered the ecological trajectory of the site significantly. So what we're we doing about these dry sites to try to address this problem? Dams are good. Here you can see timber dams, they work really well. They hold the water table high to the surface. They're very effective. Coil logs also work too. Very good. Stone dams are particularly good when there's loose sediment, loose peat. They last a long time. And as you can see, once they gather sediment, they can start to revegetate. Plastic dams also work very well. They are contentious, but they do hold water. They do raise the water table and encourage sphagnum to be colonized, degraded blanket mires. You can see from these photographs that uh, on the left, they were installed in 2014. And by 2018, they were full of sphagnum that we did not plant. So if you get the habitat right, the species will come. Also, we use heather brush with lime CO fertilizer. Cutting heather on donor sites with long heather. If they're transported to the recipient site, helicopters airlift it onto the hill. People by hand spread it. And then helicopters spread lime, seed and fertilizer in the first year with further lime and fertilizer in year two and three, if the site's needed. And a lot of them do. So here are some of the early, more, uh, early works that we've done. And you can see top right is a site that has been treated, bottom left, a site that has not been treated. This required brash lime seed fertilizer with two years of maintenance application, but it was at a cost of around about 15,000 pounds per hectare. So we have to be careful how we spend this money and how we use this resource that we do to these sites. So, as you can see from here, we are with the lime and fertilizer. We do do site surveys, and if we see a continuous green lawn, that does not need any more lime or fertilizer. The nurse crop grasses are checked for healthy root growth after the first growing season. We need them to be alive, but not necessarily to thrive. We also look out for green algae in pools or strong grassy growth in channels, which may suggest too much runoff or excess nutrients. That warns us away from further lime or fertilizer application. And we also to check our work to see if there is vegetation there in the first place to actually use that lime and that fertilizer because sometimes there isn't anything there to grow. So, what do you do to restore a damaged blanket mire with no aquatone, but no bare peat pans and a few gullies or grips? So, you can't really use the toolkit I've just described. We've done this. These are peat buns, very much like peat dams, but away from the gullies, away from the grips, away from the 
flow channels up onto the top of the hills, the low angled ground with deep beat, where the flow begins. They look rather good, I think. <laughs> so we have a trial on a site called Close Moss, owned by the National Trust Mars and Moor. The aim is restoring the Akratome. It's blending an effective technique. It's been used on low run based bogs for 50 years. The potential benefits are increased temporary and long term water storage through greater hydraulic roughness and topographical variation. It's about raising the water table, diversification of millennia and kaluna, wildfire protection and restoration, rapid sphagnum colonization, pools for better wading bird habitat as well. But there are risks. So we could damage tripside features if we're not careful with the excavators. We could disturb breeding wading birds. And there could be the creation of accidental flow paths. Now in our trial, we have installed bun types with a before, after, control, intervention design. We have three types of bunding, scallop, fish scale and contour, plus a control plot. We are monitoring hydrology with dip wells, vegetation with quadrats, peat accumulation with peat anchors, and sphagnum growth by monitoring sphagnum plugs with planted ourselves. And all this is adhering to natural England triplicide consent processes and focusing on returning the site to favourable condition. As you can see, we have monitoring within the control plot. We have monitoring on the scalloped design, the individual smiles, if you like. We have monitoring on the fish scale design, where there aren't flow paths in between the buns for water to travel on. And then on the contour buns, you can see they are bespoke to fit the contours of each individual hill. And the results after 18 months are that we need more long-term data. But so far, all three bun types are raising the water table in comparison to the control pot. Water is being slowed for up to 13 hours behind buns in pools and no remaining bare peat following construction after only 12 months. Also, there are no flow paths inadvertently or accidentally created. There may be differences between bun types. Early data suggested that contour buns may provide better long-term storage, raising the water table and making wet peat. But recently fish scale buns appear to be catching up. The fish scale buns probably provide more pooled water for longer and so may benefit wading birds more. Um, however, it's too, uh, it's too early to see the changes in the vegetation or, or peat accumulation data. However, visual evidence does suggest changes afoot, especially within the fish scale buns. Here you can see, we've actually scaled up this work. This is Holcomb Moor and Muslin Head, owned by United Utilities and the National Trust, with the 90 hectares of bunding, putting in 3,300 buns, as you can see. And as a note regarding the birds, if you look at the top left, the birds returned to the site to feed while the excavator was still on site. I was leaning against an excavator and in the evening when I took that photograph. This is Winter Hill, it burnt in 2018, 715 hectares burnt badly, completely removing the vegetation. In, in many places we're in deeply into the peat, leaving it very, very dry and unable to regenerate and be colonised. So we bundled it, 20 hectares were completed in March 2021, so hopefully the site can't quite get quite so dry again. And then furthermore, there's wildfire protection and resilience. I mentioned the roaches to you earlier today. It's worth pointing out that the only area of the roaches 2018 wildfire burn scar to attain vegetation was bunded. Thank you. Great, many thanks, uh, Chris. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our final uh, speaker for this session, Erika Tepeo, uh, who's a project manager with the Hydrology uh, Life Project in Finland. Uh, so uh, delighted to welcome you to the conference, Erika, and over to you. Good day, everyone. My name is Erika Tapio. I'm working as a project manager here in Metsähallitus, Parks and Wildlife, Finland. Currently, I'm running this big project called Hydrology Life, 
which is safeguarding peatlands and small water bodies. Greetings to you all from Arctic Circle, or to be more precise, from my kitchen. I think we all know why we are gathered here to this conference. It's not about only talking about the restoration work we are all doing. It's about we want to make a change to the fact that we have biodiversity losses and climate change. Also in Finland, Myers have gone under extensive exploitation. <clears throat> From 10 million hectares of Myers, we have nowadays roughly 8.7 million hectares and less than half of it is in natural state. We have already protected 1.2 million hectares, but from that also about 50,000 hectares has been ditched before the protection status. How this can be seen in our nature? From these two pictures you can see that the situation is severe in southern part of Finland, where in some parts over 75% of the peatland has been drained. And it of course affects our flora and fauna. Here on the graph you see the decline in birds that live in the Maya habitats. And this change has happened fast. Also these two pictures shows the situation in whole Finland and in, in right side in southern part of Finland. Every nine species in Finland is threatened and the situation is worse among birds and mosses, unfortunately. That is why we have had, and we currently also have, projects that are trying to make a change to this, this situation. Our project has started in 2017, and we have still two full years to do our actions, and we are doing restorations in over 100 Natura 2000 sites across the Finland, as you can see from the map. I'm happy to work with nearly 200 professionals who are also keen on saving the Natura 2000 sites, habitats, species and, and nature around us. We are working almost in 7,000 hectares in this project. We have nine amazing partners and about 9 million euros and altogether 35 concrete actions that we are doing. But it's not only the concrete actions. Uh, I think the benefit out of this kind of big uh, project where we are cooperating is that we come up with new ideas, new ways to do this more, this work more effective way. One of those new methods that we have come up in this this project is this uh, operating model, uh, together with landowners, forest owners, authorities, and planners. We are doing and returning water from forest to areas to the peatlands that have already suffered from dryness. So on the pictures you can see one of our pilot sites, we have five of them, and the green, green uh, lines are showing where the ditches have been planned. And it's very important to work together in this model to get an outcome that benefits us all. So we are improving habitat quality in over 11 valuable habitats. We are also doing restorations for 30 kilometers of streams, improving 14 small lakes and four bird lakes. All of our actions are actually improving the water quality and flood risk management in the catchment areas. As all projects, we are also uh, collecting and, and giving new data and trying to raise awareness about not only the importance of wetlands, but also the Natura 2000 sites. 
But let me take you to one of our sites here in Lapland. This is Gilpialpa. It's one of our biggest restoration areas. And on the far left you can see how the Maya looked like roughly a year ago. We had a nice colors on the trees as we have now. And you can see that there's a ditch dividing this big Arbomaya into two areas. And the trees have grown along the ditch. Last winter we did the restoration, so we cut off the trees and made about 30 dams to the ditch. And this June I was happy to visit this site and we also flew the drone to get some idea how, how the restoration is proceeding. And here you can see on the far right that the water has raised up very nicely. And if you look from the ditch to the right side, you see that it's actually raising up on the Maya also that was dry before. So we are very hopeful that this, this restoration is going to work and the species can return to this area. Our work is in process. We have done almost 60% of the restoration target we have had and we have restored 5 kilometers of streams already. Some bird lakes have also been restored and from there we got very positive uh, feedback that the numbers of birds are actually coming back and uh, increasing in shorter time than we expected. All of us we need to work on collecting the data, monitoring our actions and doing new projects uh, with the knowledge from the, what we see in the nature, what is actually happening when we do the restoration. And in hydrology life, we are actually proceeding work that was started in Suoverkosta life in 2007. Then uh, we established this uh, monitoring network to the peatland restoration sites. And as you can see from the map, it goes across the Finland. We have different type of myers here, different type of restoration work done, and also controls for those. Altogether, there's 120 sites that we are monitoring, and we are checking both vegetation and the hydrological changes. And during this project now, our attempt is to get the result that how the water quality and the vegetation is actually changing. Because we have now here sites that have been restored 10 to 15 years ago. As something new, we are studying how restoration work is affecting protected bats. And also we are trying to get uh, understanding of the socio-economic impacts of restoration work. From this slide, I could talk another 10 minutes, but I'm just quickly showing that we are developing ways of using drone for the monitoring work also. So from different kind of images, we can also see that how is the water levels uh, changing in the wires. This is maybe our, our biggest challenge in all the projects and us working with the nature sciences. We have already a lot of data and somehow we also, we, we know how to sort it out. We even try to present it visually many times. But what we have to learn and what I challenge you is to tell the stories. Because the stories are the most effective way to share information with one another. I am not going to tell all of our informing actions and natural edu nature education actions that we have done, but I challenge you to try out our wetland game, which is also in English. And in that game, you can um, see by yourself how your choices affect the nature. Well, what is Finland going to do with these big challenges and restoration need that we have? I'm happy to show this 
this graph with you and tell that we are speeding up with these actions. So on four years, we are actually doing more restoration in Finland than we have done in 15 years. And that is to our project and also Helmi program that our government is funding, where we are doing a lot of restoration during this decade. Maybe the home take home message from this is that um, we don't have time to gamble anymore. We we have to do and we have to base those actions on the knowledge that we get from the nature and do it more wise way. We need more projects like Hydro and, and our Helmi program. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Erika, and uh, thanks to all our uh, speakers in this session for um, a great uh, sequence of talks. Uh, so the first thing I've got to say is to disappoint you by saying that um, we're going to go on a little bit after five past one, which was the scheduled finish time. So the IUCN um, um, team have agreed we can have 20 minutes for questions. So I'm proposing to go on until quarter past one. Uh, uh, if that's okay. And um, we've had a, a really great range of questions. Um, a good, I've accepted all of them through, so conference should be able to see uh, pretty much the whole lot. And they do divide into two groups a little bit. They divide into ones um, tackling the kind of fundamental question, which was the title of this uh, of this part of the conference of restoration trajectories and the other homing in on some of the um, specific restoration uh, types of methodologies used. Um, so I think it's only democratic, but um, the first question I pose to the panel is the one that's got by far the most votes, uh, which reads as follows. These presentations all show the importance of long-term data sets, but despite this, funders tend to be reluctant to support ongoing research monitoring. Uh, in favour of novel or short-term research, how do we encourage funders to properly value and support long-term uh, long research and monitoring? That's the, I've paraphrased uh, slightly, I'm sorry. Can I ask uh, Richard to have a go at this one first, please? <laughs> Thanks, Pete, for that loaded grenade. Um, uh, yes, the brutal answer is uh, good luck with that. Um, the issue has been a live issue ever since nature conservation left the hallowed portals of universities where professors like Tamsley and Godwin could go out and set up an experiment and carry out monitoring to their heart's content and it was all funded by the university. That world no longer exists. It's been an ongoing debate essentially since World War II uh, with that change in the way we do things. But actually there is, I do detect a change in uh, recognition of, of what's needed. And um, I mean, even within discussions with DEFRA, uh, there is recognition that longer term monitoring does need to be funded. Um, there are also practical ways of doing this. If you put in a funding bid, then put in an element of the bid that says we will continue the monitoring of an established project. So you piggyback on a project that has already been carried out. And uh, I know, for example, Erica has been able to do this in Finland. And indeed, we've done this with our sphagnum farming monitoring where the original project was set up through an Innovate UK grant. We now have a people's postcode lottery project, which is helping us to continue monitoring the original Innovate UK. So I guess the, the two things I'd like to get across is uh, do consider piggybacking uh, on existing projects when you bid 
Um, and uh, secondly, we need to keep the pressure up on encouraging funders to consider uh, funding long-term commitments to seeing the success or otherwise of our actions. Thanks, Pete. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. I was just going to say, um, Erica, would you would would you like to come in there with a comment on your experience from the from the Finnish project? Thank you. So yeah, we have been uh, able to continue the monitoring work, which is causing a lot of money, so that we have all the time some live project which we are running here in the Metsä Hallitus. And Hydrogen Life is now first one where we actually get the results gathered up from a longer time. Thanks very much, Erica. Uh, Chris, Chris Miller, could you would you like to come in there as well, please? Yeah, thanks, Pete. Um, if the if the situation is important enough, then governments and other organizations can find the money to do it and they have set up long-term monitoring networks before for example the acid waters monitoring network that was set up in in, in the 80s so there is the possibility of having these long-term monitoring networks peatlands are now definitely recognized as being of very high importance so i think we should be going back to the powers that be and saying why why can't we have this long-term monitoring network it's needed to ensure value for money and also to make sure that we deliver the benefits that we're predicting thank you chris i mean just to you know abuse my position here and just uh, say our experience in wales has been it's difficult to to, to get long-term monitoring resourced but as a community surely we should be able to pull this off uh, there's more of us than there have ever been there's more money coming into peatland restoration we're fantastically well uh, set up with academic uh, support from the universities from um, ceh etc so uh, surely this isn't beyond us to to achieve it so thanks very much to the panel for answers to that the uh, next um, another very popular uh, question and I think it's a very very relevant one uh, is do we need an overview group across the UK looking at restoration trajectories and helping build a standard approach and I was wondering if uh, Emma would you be willing to comment on that please Thanks, great. Uh, I hope the person who asked that question is now putting themselves forward to coordinate that group because that would be brilliant. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like having a truly standard approach to, to monitoring and evidencing these trajectories might be a bit difficult because all projects will have different aims and scope, different um, resources, different uh, funding durations, as we've just talked about. But there are definitely some things that we could all get together and agree is in terms of best practice, in terms of monitoring, things like um, getting some baseline pre-intervention data, having a control site so you can assess changes relative to that, relative to doing nothing. Um, and also this idea of this longer term trajectory, which is so important. Some of those trajectories I showed in my talk today. I think it was only with like the last year's worth of data that you actually started to see a significant trend, something you could prove statistically as being important. So yeah, kind of building on the, the previous discussion, maybe a group talking about best practice in terms of monitoring could also become a force for, for campaigning for these longer term monitoring projects as well. So perhaps that, thanks very much, Emma. So perhaps that's one to ask um, the uh, IUCN staff just to, to keep track on and make and make note of. I mean, the other thing I would say more generally is that I think we're definitely getting to a point where the four UK countries need to, uh, you know, harmonise as much as they can the way we monitor people and ecosystem responses to uh, to restoration, not least for, for, for national reporting purposes. So uh, thank you. Chris, did, uh, Chris Miller again, did you want to come in on that or am, am, am I looking at uh, older questions? Sorry. <laughs> And you're on mute. I'll, but I'll, I'll do a question, but I can chip in if you like. Um, I think one of the challenges uh, is around people actually, you see a highly incredibly degraded site, say a peat extraction site. How can you env possibly envisage where that's going to go? 
And that's where the ongoing trajectory monitoring work really helps at showing people the pathway to get where they want to go with their particular site, because every site is different. Every site's got a slightly different pathway, but at least if we can see examples of that pathway that can help people. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. I'm now going to move on to uh, some of the questions that which are um, uh, a bit more uh, uh, tightly aligned to some of the, the the restoration practice that we saw in the pictures uh, in in the talks. I'm sorry, uh, and one of these, uh, and it got a good number of likes actually, was uh, why use uh, coir logs if peat buns are the most effective? And I was wondering, Jenny, would you be prepared to answer that, please? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Pete. Um, well, they're actually uh, used in two very different uh, situations. So the coir logs come into their own, really, where you can't get in with machinery. So if you've got large areas, for example, of flat bare peat, um, and if you sent a machine in to try to do anything, it would just churn it up and create a horrible mess and probably drown in the process. So the coir logs really do come into their own there. Um, and in the sort of shallower gullies uh, as well. Um, the peat buns are very effective in sort of wider gullies, uh, often deeper gullies. Um, quite often in my experience, they've been gullies that in the past we probably wouldn't have done anything with. They look sort of fairly harmless and innocuous, but once you've actually, you do start to put the um, peat buns in, then you can actually see how much water really is coming down the system. And very often what you'll see is that further down the system, if you follow the flow, there is a massive gully at the end of that sort of wider channel. And so the peat bund is actually preventing that wide gully from being eroded even further. Um, and very often those gullies are already down to the mineral. So I think they play a really essential role um, in restoring the hydro hydrological system, um, um, but both coir logs and peat buns have their place for sure. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, would would Alastair would like to come in on any commentary on that? Yeah, thank you. Um, it, it's, like Jenny said, the, the two very different approaches, and and you've got to kind of work with the landowners as well. So. Um, you know the the peat bonds creating rather large pools um, on the land. It may be best for um, peatlands. We don't know, but it, it also has to work with the landowners and the stakeholders um, that are involved in that. So it's kind of a balancing act, really. Great, many thanks, um, Alistair. Um, I'm just. Uh, uh, failing miserably in my attempt at multitasking um, here. There was another, uh, just flipping back to the trajectories issue, there was an interesting question about uh, the, the whole business of in planning and describing tra trajectories, how important do we feel it is that we, in 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 um, designing uh, monitoring programs that we take into account birds, invertebrates, uh, uh, plants, as, as well as hydrology. And I'm just going to throw that open to the panel, please. I think that you're kind of looking for the holy grail uh, because we don't have enough money to monitor everything or every, you know, every species, every creature on the peat bog. I mean, it'd be great, but we don't. So we have to be careful in the ones we choose. And, you know, at the moment, water and vegetation cover seem to be pretty good, but they do fail on, on other things, as we saw from some of the presentations about intact fens yesterday. Uh, and, you know, something like the Desmoulin snail. So... Yeah, it is important to account for, you know, what you've got on your site. But, you know, I'd love the B2B to be a golden bullet, which just tells us if you've got that one thing, that site's in a good condition. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Uh, Richard, would you like to come in there? Because I know you posted a comment uh, about um, spiders in particular as being of high indicator value. Yeah, thanks, Pete. 
Um, yeah, I would entirely agree with Chris Miller's comment about the, um, well, the resource implications of trying to measure everything. Um, uh, the, I mean, obviously the reason we use plants is that they're mostly there all year round. So if your monitoring is controlled by uh, funding availability or by seasonality, then uh, you, know, you can usually get something useful from the plants. Um, birds of mobile migrate, uh, and so they may or may not be there. Um, the, I work a lot with the spider recorder for London and Middlesex, uh, Edward Milner. And uh, he's got a lot of experience across the country including on peatlands. And um, he's a strong believer in spiders being another really good indicator of ecosystem condition because they tend not to be as mobile as, for example, beetles. Um, they are quite selective about where they, uh, where they establish. Um, so, I mean, it may be that there are certain groups um, and I, wouldn't tend to include beetles or, or even birds, although I love dunlin as an indicator of a good bog. Um, uh, there may be certain groups that would be worth investigating to focus on, uh, but at the moment, reality basically means vegetation and hydrology. Okay, thank you very much, Richard. Um, we have a, a question, quite a fundamental uh, question actually, about do we have concerns about the long-term impact of buns in, in the uplands? We've, we've been asked the same question. Could I ask Chris Fry to look at that, please? And Chris, just to apologise to you, because I know you also wanted to chip in on the Coyologs uh, question, so if you'd like to address that as well, that would be great. Thank you. Um, I just coming around the coil log question, I guess one of the reasons why I set up the bun trial in the first place is because we're using coil logs at our great expense. They cost much more than a peat dam to put in, yet they come from around the world. So I couldn't see that as the best option to use if we get away with it. Um, and the reason why I think we weren't using machines so much is because we told ourselves we couldn't use machines very much. I think there's a lot of false seals we've put on ourselves in this work, in this work uh, when actually our toolkit is quite juvenile and we should look forward to a lot of innovation and increasing our knowledge and our abilities. So um, I set up the trial to look at what buns might do. Um, and in terms of the, the comment about, um, the, the, there are several comments about the buns. There was one was saying, how can we be confident? What was the question you were just asking, sorry? Yeah, sorry, just to mute myself, Chris. Uh, it was, do we have concerns about the long-term impact of buns in the uplands? Right, well, of course, we have concerns about the impact of long term the, the, the buns, but we have concerns about our uplands generally. We can't get away from that. We have risks everywhere we look with the uplands that I work on. We haven't got the option of standing still, is how I see it. Else we'll watch things degrade and get worse. So we have to do something. And so what we've tried to do is investigate and push at the toolkit with our eyes wide open to see what we might achieve. Um, and it's worth pointing out, as I mentioned earlier, stakeholders are so important to this. So that on that slide I showed you, Holcomb and Stubbins, where we put in 90 hectares of bunding, that is a common. And we spoke with the commoners and we had a meeting with them. We gave it to them, they do you want this work? And we gave them the choice to say yes or no. And they said yes, because they wanted it, because they knew there's a risk and a gamble over their long-term future, over um, agricultural policies, funding, um, grant schemes, all that sort of thing. We were honest with them and truthful because you have to be in stakeholder engagement about the risks that you can't deal with. Uh, but they felt that this was the best option for them given the risk that they faced. And so they said yes. And so we we're really pleased to do this work because it is innovative, but the stakeholders engage with that. Great, thank you very much, Chris. I think we've probably only got time for one more now. And um, uh, again, I'm sort of slightly unapologetically uh, uh, sticking with the trajectories theme because that, that's that's the job the IUCN gave to us today to consider that. Uh, and it's one of the very last questions which came in and it is any tips for practitioners on how to predict long-term tra trajectories as this is something that funders are increasingly asking for. So in other words, what should we predict our long-term trajectory is going to be? 
uh, wonder could I ask Richard to come in and answer that and then please, anyone else do please chip in. I think this will have to be our last question. Thank you. Okay, Pete. Um, yeah, that's a, a tricky one to answer uh, because if you predefine your trajectory endpoint, there's a danger that you will constrain the very thing that I was talking about in my talk, which is you allow the system to express itself. Uh, if you constrain it, if you impose your expectations on it, then you won't allow the system to express its natural processes. Um, so by saying we will develop this uh, cladium moriscus fen, um, you know, may, you may be setting yourself up to fail or to set yourself up to increasing expense as you try and create the system that the system is simply not geared to produce. So I think we need to be very careful about being too prescriptive about uh, trajectory endpoints. And perhaps we should be, if we're looking at how we define trajectories to funders, we talk about the processes that we want to re-establish rather than the specifics of a particular vegetation type or whatever. Let the system speak for itself. Thanks very much, Richard. Chris Fry, I think you'd like to come in and just uh, top that one off, please. Thank you. Should I call on that? More so, the future always being pushed to um, improve these degraded landscapes for water, for carbon, for recreation, for flood alleviation, for a multitude of things. And as far as I'm aware, we've never asked this of the landscape before proactively. So we're asking a whole new thing of our landscape. Um, and so we don't know what we're going to get. This has never happened before. The landscape has never been pushed in this way or asked to do this before, nor we tried hard. So if we try to predict what we're going to get, we're only going to get what we've done before. So if we want something new, we're going to have to open our um, eyes and minds to the risk that we face with innovation. But we have to be, it's, it's a careful calculated risk. But we can't get away from risk, whichever way we go. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks ever so much, Chris. I think we're going to have to draw it to a close there. So we've uh, sadistically left you with only 15 minutes lunchtime uh, b before the exhibition hall networking meeting. But um, one of the great advantages of doing a remote conference is that you can just turn your camera off and uh, uh, eat away with impunity so thank you very much indeed to all our speakers um, uh, in this session I think it's been a really stimulating and thought-provoking uh, session it's one where I think you know significant development and investment is needed because uh, it, it's an important area of work uh, so many thanks to the participants uh, many thanks to all of you who listened and thanks also to Chris Blair for providing um, all the technical uh, support for this and all the very best to you.